All right, friends. Hey, good morning and welcome to you. We're glad that you are here today to worship with us. I don't know, it sounds like I'm too loud. Uh, and uh, I am happy that the kids are singing today as well. Let me check and see my schedule. When are they singing today? All right, they'll be singing between the second and third Bible reading. So, uh, that's good. I needed to know exactly when, and now I do. We're happy to invite back Pastor uh, Bussert for our sermon today. He'll be our guest preacher. Uh, he's been with us for close to 10 years anyways in stewardship. He had to go and retire on us, and now he's doing things like singing in German. So, uh, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit about that, uh, that today. Uh, anyways, our stewardship uh, program continues, and we're very thankful uh, to be able to talk about those gifts and blessings that God has given to us that we are to steward and use according to his plan and purpose. And so we've had this two weeks already, not mine. We talked about our bodies and our time, and this week, our talents, those gifts and abilities that God has given to us, not only to be used for our purpose, but also for his purpose, and we'll hear more about that. And our chancel flowers today are given by the Copping family in celebration of Samantha's birthday, so we're very thankful uh, to the coppings for the flowers in our church today. Finally, our members would have received a faith commitment card in the mail, and um, there's one at the end of the pew today. For next week, our Faith Commitment Sunday, we're inviting you to participate in uh, filling this out and allowing our Board of Stewardship and our finance team to know about our uh, pledges for giving for the next year. If you did not get one, or you're not a member of this church, but you're a member of another church, you can take one from the end of the pew. You can use it for your own purpose. Turn it into your church. I'm just saying that because we have a lot of people here who are Trinity School families, but you are members of another church somewhere else. You can use it as your own uh, stewardship practice. Uh, personally, and, uh, and we just want to thank our stewardship team for, uh, for providing that opportunity. So that will be next week, our faith commitment, our conclusion to our stewardship series, and then the final uh, Sunday in October, the next week after that, will be our Reformation uh, celebration. So we're looking forward to the celebration uh, day then. All right, friends, our service continues with our invocation. I invite you to stand, but uh, before we continue with that, I'm just going to invite you. No, go ahead and stand. I'm going to invite you to say hello to your neighbor. Just turn and say good morning and welcome. All right, friends, we continue with the invocation this morning. We remember our baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, and we sing holy forever. Hey guys, before we get started, I'd just like to say, in case the slide does go out up there, we've just been having some technical difficulties today, so bear with us. Thank you all. Yep, oh wow, okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry. creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever and if you've been forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the good gifts that you have given to us, for all the blessings that we have in our life. We thank you for our family and friends. 
We thank you for our skills, talents, and abilities, but chiefly we thank you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that today as we come before you, we might honor you and worship you and praise you, but also that we might receive from you your word to equip us and to strengthen us and encourage us to go and serve others for your kingdom purpose. Come and be among us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue with our confession and absolution today. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you. We have failed to love others the way you love us. We have failed to keep your holy commands. We have failed to love you perfectly. We deserve your punishment and condemnation, but we call upon Jesus for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated for our song. i 
has lost its grip on me. the precious blood of Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks as we pause at this moment. We thank you for the gift of forgiveness that you have given to us today. We thank you for the gift of your word and the gift of this time to be in fellowship and encouragement with one another. We pray, O oh God, that as your scripture is read, that we might hear these words and understand them. Grant us wisdom from on high and help us to apply them to our lives as we consider all the good things that you give to us. We are thankful that you bless us with so many good gifts. We pray that uh, you would help us this day acknowledge and be thankful for all those good things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first reading today possibly the shortest reading we've ever had at Trinity Lutheran Church. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 4. The sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading today is from Romans chapter 12. St. Paul is writing... For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another." Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rejoice and ablaze choirs are next.
Thank you, Rejoice and Ablaze Choirs. We appreciate you, and your song is encouragement to us today. You are using God's gifts in uh, your music uh, for us, and we're so very thankful for that. Our third Bible reading today is from Matthew chapter 25, beginning with the 14th verse. Jesus is speaking. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness." In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, the children are uh, dismissed to be with Mr. Grady for the children's message, and we continue with the song, Christ Be Magnified.
its inmost melody. And every human heart its hidden pride. And in one enraptured hymn of we'll sing Christ be Thank you to our um, musicians this morning. You know, there was a time when if someone was growing up and liked to play the drums or the guitar, there was nothing for them to do in a church. Um, and today there is. So we're going to be talking about talents and abilities. And so I'm thankful for, for you folks, both your instrumental and vocal things. Would you pray with me this, as we begin? Father, we come before you to hear and contemplate your word. I pray, Lord, that, uh, that your Holy Spirit would enter our minds and our hearts to shape and mold us according to your will, that we would, um, that we would understand something today that you are specifically directing to each one of us, and that then, then we would follow through and apply that to our lives and take action on it. Uh, may this be possible by your power in us. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, I'm glad to be back today. Um, those of you who are school parents probably don't know uh, who I am, but um, I was on the staff here for a while, actually about 10 years, in the area of, in the area of stewardship ministry. And that's, that's a topic that, is, that became in my life very close to my heart. Wasn't always. Um, when I entered seminary a long, long time ago, uh, there was zero training in, the, in our seminaries on the, in the area of stewardship, generosity, church finances, all that stuff. Same with you, Pastor Bob? Correct. Nothing, all right? So we come out, you know, greenhorns, and we get dumped into, um, into a situation where all of a sudden we're having to deal with this constantly on an almost daily basis. Uh, specifically in, in, in churches, it often has to do with how are we going to pay the bills and, and what staff can we afford and what can't we afford and all that kind of stuff. And, and we have no idea. Um, so it's on the job training for us. 
And, uh, and, and, and I just learned over, over time um, to actually find great interest in this area. And also that I just saw this task of the management of our blessings, not just from a pastoral point of view, a staff point of view, but from a personal Christian, from an every Christian point of view, to see that this is a fundamental part of our faith, to see that we as Christians have a deep duty to manage God's blessings to us on his behalf. So I retired um, a while back, and, uh, and I feel very honored that I was invited back to be a part of your uh, annual stewardship emphasis. Pastor Bob um, mentioned that in my retirement I'm singing in German. Is that weird or what? But uh, I, have, I have always loved to sing since I was a little kid. But when I was a parish pastor, um, I could not take another night away of the week from my family to be in the church choir. I was already gone at a meeting or a, at a wedding or you know some such thing, three or four nights a week, and I just could not be in a choir. So when I started uh, sliding towards retirement gradually, I said, one of my retirement things I'm gonna do is sing in a choir. And the question was, what choir? So I kind of looked around the landscape, we were living in Elmhurst at the time, and I discovered that they have a choir. It's been in Elmhurst for over 100 years, from back when German immigrants were pouring into this whole area. You know, this congregation was founded by German immigrants 150, 60 years ago. That used to be really common, and they didn't have television and stuff like that in those days, so what did they do for fun? People that liked to sing got together, and they formed what were called Gesangvereins, a singing club. And, uh, and, and that's kind of how they entertained themselves. Well, Elmhurst still has one of those, so, so I joined it. Um, why am I mentioning this? There's two reasons why. One is that we're working on our Christmas program. It's more of a sing-along than a concert. And this year, we're doing two of them, and one of them is going to be right here at Trinity on December 10th. Um, and uh, all those kids that you just saw leave and go to, uh, uh, go to Sunday school and stuff like that, they don't know this yet. They're going to find this out on this Wednesday. But I'm going to come here and teach them a song in German. And they're going to sing that with, uh, with the choir that I'm in uh, on December 10th. Won't they be surprised? <laughs> the other reason is because those of you that know me, some of you may have said, what happened to his face? Because I normally keep a very short beard, but the choir has conned me into portraying St. Nicholas, and so I'm growing out my beard until December uh, to be St. Nicholas. So you'll see more publicity on this, at least in this church, and I'd love it if you you'd come. It's going to be a great time. All right, on to the subject at hand. Not mine. Not mine. Uh, that's the, the, the theme that uh, Pastor Bob uh, gave me to, uh, to focus on today, specifically my talents, not mine. I don't know if uh, any of the mailings that you've gotten or anything had had this picture on it. It's kind of far away for some of you to see it. Um, but uh, that's kind of the logo of this year's stewardship program. If you can't see it, it's basically some, like business papers. Maybe someone's paying their bills or whatever, and there's a post-it note on it that says, not mine. An important reminder that would be good for all of us. I'll bet, I'll bet all of you have a pad of post-it notes at home, right? They've become ubiquitous. Who doesn't love post-it notes? And here's my suggestion. Take your pad of post-it notes, write not mine on a, on a whole bunch of them, and go around your house and stick it on things. On the refrigerator, not mine. On your video console, not mine. On your clothes in your closet, not mine. On the windshield of your car, not mine. Because 
we human beings were very fond of the word my, aren't we? My car, my house, my clothes, my job, my investments. We say that all the time. English is full of what the grammarians call possessive pronouns. Mine, yours, his, hers, theirs, ours, someone's. Uh, and it, it occurred to me while I was thinking about this, getting ready for today, that the Ten Commandments that God gave uh, thousands of years ago and that we still pay attention to today were given by God to define what belongs to whom. Stop and think about that for a moment. I'm just going to look at the what we call the second table of the law. The first three commandments are about our relationship with God. The fourth through tenth commandments are about our relationship with other people. And, and they're about who, who has what. The fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. And, and Martin Luther said that applies not only to mom and dad, but also to other authority figures in our lives. And what are they entitled to? What do they get? Honor and dignity. Fifth commandment, you shall not kill. That person's life, that person's body belongs to them. Your body belongs to you. Defend it, protect it, don't take it. Sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. That person's spouse belongs to them. Your spouse belongs to you. Leave the other person's uh, spouse alone. Seventh commandment, you shall not steal. Well, what could be more about possessions than that? Don't take what belongs to someone else. Eighth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Their reputation is valuable to them. Don't trash their good name, their reputation. Ninth and tenth commandments, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's manservant or maidservant, his livestock, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Belongs. The word belongs is actually right in there. That whole manservant, maidservant. Any of you have manservants and maidservants at home? We wish. All right? What it's really talking about is employees. The people that work for you or work with you. And it says, don't sneak away that other company's workers or employees that are valuable to that company. Well, no wonder that Western civilization so profoundly shaped by Christianity is so fixated on possessions. Because we are, aren't we? We're really into this my, my, my thing. But all those things really are dignity, our lives, our bodies, our property, our reputation, our careers. They aren't really ours at all, are they? They're merely entrusted to us for a while by God. Let me use your, your car as an example because we all talk about my car. I have a, I have a this or or of that. Well, in a few years, it's going to be someone else's car when it's, when it's a used car. In fact, maybe it was a used car when you bought it. If you're smart, you know, you would buy a car that didn't already lose $5,000 when you first drove it off the parking lot. So pre-owned cars was someone else's. Now it's yours. In a few years, it'll probably belong to someone else. You know, it's just yours for a little while. Not only that, but eventually it will reach the end of its useful life and it'll belong to Victory Auto Wreckers or someone like that, where people will come and take pieces of it, fenders and steering wheels or what have you, and put them in their cars. And when it's stripped down completely, then it goes in the crusher and it belongs to a recycler who will 
take all the metal out of it and some electronics and stuff like that, and it'll all go out to a bunch of other people. 10 or 20 years from now, what is your car today may wind up in somebody else's cell phone or plastic pop bottle. And then, what is left of it and can't be used will wind up in a landfill, which means it belongs to some farmer somewhere whose dirt is on top of it. What we have is not really ours. We just get it for a while, and then it moves on because everything ultimately belongs to God. And this is the most fundamental precept of Christian stewardship. Everything we have still belongs to God. It's merely on loan to us. You know, when we borrow money from a bank, maybe for a mortgage or uh, to take a car loan, that money doesn't belong to us, even if a check is in our hands and staring us in the face and looks really nice. It doesn't belong to us. Eventually, we pay it back with interest. Today, I look out at a congregation of intelligent and talented people. And you're saying, who, me? Is he talking about me? He doesn't know me. Well, I know some of you because I worked here for a while and, and I got to know your personalities, your careers, your accomplishments, your service, things like that. But even if I don't know you, well, people don't dress like you and drive cars like those out in the parking lot there and live in places like Burr Ridge and Hinsdale and Lamont and New Lenox without being intelligent and talented. That's how I know I'm looking at intelligent and talented people. Now, as you look at your life, you might say, I have succeeded, I have prospered because of my brains, my hard work, my ambition, my gutsiness, my good looks. And don't laugh about that because the fact of the matter is the beautiful people make more money in life than the homely people. Sorry, everybody, it's just a fact. But we may give ourselves credit for our success and our accomplishments in life. There's all those mys again, my brains, my ambition. Well, guess what? Even those intangible things belong to God. Do you remember being in kindergarten? For some of you, that's not so far back. For others of us, it was a really long time ago. I don't, I don't remember kindergarten, but I remember first grade because that was the year my family moved in January of my first grade year from one small town to another small town in a different state. And I can remember in about the end of January of my first grade year walking into my new first grade classroom. I remember it was that time of the year because there were these cut out silhouette uh, profiles of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, right? Because President's Day was coming and so I can remember that. But I'm sure that as soon as I walked in, I began sizing up my new classmates, my future friends, you know, looking at each one and making some little judgment about them, you know? She's pretty, he's dumb, she's smart, he really knows how to throw a ball. I don't remember doing that, but I assume I did it because that's what kids do. We measure other people against ourselves. I'm smarter than him, but not as smart as her. He can throw a ball faster than I can, but I can sing better than him. Do you know what we're really doing in our five and six-year-old brains when we do that? We're beginning to assess our talents. We're figuring out what we're good at and what we're not so good at. And this continues as we get older. I was 
I was thinking about that as I was watching our choirs up here and the difference between a third grader singing and an eighth grader singing. Do you see the difference? The third graders were like, oh, like this, you know? And the eighth graders were like, why is that? Because kids are comparing themselves to each other. And someone says about the time someone's in sixth or seventh grade, you look like a dork up there. And what could be worse? And they just stop doing it. They might love to sing, but they don't want to be compared unfavorably to someone else. And that goes on, you know, it's a little different in every stage. Teenagers in high school, constantly comparing themselves to each other. Who's good looking? Who's athletic? Who, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it continues on into adulthood where we look at our success, our accomplishments or whatever, and we attach symbols to them. You know, symbols like the cars that we drive, the, the, our incomes, the promotions we get, what town we live in. Those become a measure of our success or failure, our pride or our shame. Did you ever see the bumper sticker that says, my other car is a Lamborghini? Which is, in other words, never mind this rusty 20-year-old Honda Civic, I'm still better than you anyway. That was a long time ago when I first started seeing those. Uh, I don't remember when it was, but Americans have this kind of corporate sense of humor, and as soon as people started coming out with my other car is a Lexus or whatever, then the humor kicked in and the, the spoofs, the parodies of that bumper sticker came out, like, my other car is a tank. Or, my other car is a car with a sticker that says my other car is this car. Or, my other car is, oh, um, I don't have another car. But really, is your intelligence, your success, really seriously defined by the car you're driving? Or the car that you lie to other people that you're claiming to have? Why is it that we feel this need to inflate our abilities and accomplishments? Probably just about everyone that's here today has had to compose a resume at some point, right? Everyone, almost everyone, you've had to write a resume. Resumes are notorious for the lies that are in them. And everyone knows this. We write these things in our resumes making ourselves look better than probably we really are because we want our prospective employee to think, oh, this will be a great employee, a real asset to my office or my company or my store or, or whatever. We know that it has exaggerations in it. Guess what? Every HR officer also knows this isn't all true. But we keep doing this. Why? I think, <laughs> I think there's a theological, a spiritual reason for it. It's because so much of the time we have forgotten that our talents come from God belong to God, and exist to serve and glorify God. That's such a crucial concept that I want to repeat that. We forget that our talents come from God, belong to God, and exist to serve and glorify God. And here you thought your talents were to make you a million bucks. Sorry, not so. At the church that I attend, um, we're doing, we're in a sermon series on the book of Exodus right now, and, and the small group Bible study that my wife and I are in is also tracking, you know, our Bible study tracks the, the Sunday message. And last week, we were studying uh, Exodus chapters 3 and 4. That's the story where Moses sees the burning bush. Everybody familiar with that story? Have you seen the old movie, if you haven't read the book? Moses sees this bush that's on fire, and it's not burning out. 
So in that moment, God is calling him to rescue the Hebrew slaves from slavery in Egypt, where they had been slaves for, for 400 years. Moses, you may recall, had been raised in the lap of luxury in Egypt, then murdered a man, fled the country, and for 40 years, he's been living with his Bedouin tribe, shepherds, marries, has a couple kids, and, and you know his life is a, a total 180 degree turnaround. And then God shows up, hey Moses, go back to the one of the most powerful kings in the world at that time, the Pharaoh of Egypt, and tell him that I said to let his slaves all go. You remember the outcome of that conversation? Moses is like, um, no. He comes up with every excuse in the book. I'm a nobody. They won't believe me. Who should I say sent me? And besides that, I have a speech impediment. And God is very patient with Moses. He keeps saying, okay, but I'll do this. I'll help you with that. And finally, Moses reaches the end of his list and he says, please, God, just send someone else. Then God gets mad. And here's the verse that really struck me while we were studying that, because I was already thinking about what I was going to say today. The Lord said, Who gave people their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will help you and speak. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. You see, Moses' problem was that he thought God was sending him to do this impossible task based on his own abilities. And he said, I can't do it. And God said, you don't understand, Moses. I'm going to be there. I will give you what you need to accomplish this enormous task. Moses didn't know this, but God, all through Moses' life, had already been uniquely equipping him for this mission. Well, God also gives you talents for a purpose. And the question is, are you going to say yes or no to God? Thank you, whoever said that. The church is composed of people who are all uniquely talented. This is one of the beautiful things about a church. Paul talked about that in our second reading this morning. He said, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. And a crucial word in those verses that we often skip right over is the word each. Each one of us. How many times I've talked to people over the years, probably I was trying to recruit them for something, or, or just talking to them about service, and they would say, oh, pastor, I can't do that. I, I'm not talented enough. In fact, they would say, I don't have any talents at all. I can't do anything. Well, guess what? This says God has given something to each one of you. God's gifts come in three forms. First of all, there are the talents that people are born with. Let me use a fairly well-known example of some famous musicians. And it's not not, uh, Taylor Swift or Beyonce. It's J.S. Bach and Mozart. You've heard those names, all right? They both essentially were child musical prodigies. But Bach grew up to use his talents to serve and glorify God, whereas Mozart basically used his frivolously for personal fame 
and uh, you know, self-aggrandizement. But Mozart died in poverty and was buried in an unmarked grave. While Bach went on through his family to have multiple generations of composers, musicians, organists, serving churches, and royal courts. Secondly, there are skills that are acquired by learning and practice. Think about the athletes that, that you are um, interested in, whether they're on a baseball team or a, a football team or whatever. Sure, they may have been born with some innate physical qualities and, and athletic talents, but every one of them have honed those abilities with years of relentless practice. Solomon wrote, we heard this this morning, sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest times they look and find nothing. Meaning, something is not going to come into your life accidentally without some effort on your part. Even innate talents require work and effort to develop and turn into real productivity in your life. Even our natural talents need to develop, be developed with work. Somebody once commented to Thomas Edison how lucky he was to discover the secrets to develop the electric light bulb, to which he replied, it seems to me that the harder I work, the luckier I get. And then thirdly, there are spiritual gifts given by God. That's what Paul was writing about in our second lesson today, Romans 12 and elsewhere in the New Testament. Spiritual gifts are abilities that God specifically gives to people for building up the body of Christ, the church. Things like mercy, leadership, discernment, teaching, generosity. I said earlier that a beautiful thing about the church is that everyone uh, has different gifts and talents and abilities. The sad thing about churches is that about 70 to 80% of church members are not using those abilities for the Lord at all as far as one could tell from looking at them. Jesus addressed that issue in our gospel lesson today, where a wealthy man, who obviously in the parable represents God, is going to go away for a, for a lengthy period of time, and so he calls in three of his servants, his employees, and he gives them all varying portions of his possessions. And I'm sure you noticed that it uses the word talents, but it's not talking about talents the way we think about talents, like musical or athletic or business or something like that. In the first century, a talent was actually a measure of weight, usually for weighing precious things like gold or silver. And so what the master was actually giving to his servants were measures of his, of his money. And a talent of silver or a talent of gold was a great deal of money. It was a, it was a lot. And so he gives one of them, and Jesus says, each according to his ability. So the master gives to one of his servants five bags of gold, to another two bags of gold, and to the servant number three, one bag of gold. And then he leaves, goes on a long Caribbean cruise, I suppose, comes back, and servant one, during the absence, has been playing the stock market or cultivating his, what he had on loan from his master and had doubled it. He started with five. He says, here, master, here's 10. The master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Then servant number two comes in. Here, master, you gave me two, here's four. And you might think the master would say, well, that's not as much as servant number one. But he still used it faithfully and doubled the amount. And the master says, well done, 
good and faithful servant. And then servant number three comes in and he says, here's your money back. And it always occurred to me that maybe the master was a little harsh with this guy because he didn't go out and put it in a scam or a Ponzi scheme or something and blow it all and lose it. The master got back what belonged to him. But he says, you wicked, lazy servant. Because I entrusted this to you to do something with it, presumably as he would have done if he was there. He expected a return on what he had placed into this servant's hands. You wicked, lazy servant. Well, to put it nicely, what Jesus was saying here is that he desires us to use our talents and skills and abilities and spiritual gifts to bear fruit for him. And as his followers, that's what we want too, right? I'm saying that a little bit tongue-in-cheek because the fact of the matter is I've known a lot of church members and a lot of them don't seem to want to use their talents, skills, and abilities to serve and glorify God at all. To put it in not-so-nice terms, we are accountable to God for our use, abuse, or non-use of those gifts. And someday we will stand before God, the judge of all people, on the last day. Not so happy a prospect for those who have buried their gifts in a hole in the ground. One might ask you, are you going to be a Bach or a Mozart? Now, just thinking about what the Bible says about our talents and abilities, I could end the sermon right here. But I would be remiss as a Lutheran pastor if I left it there and didn't add one more thing which is this. It's a recognition that none of us is a perfect steward. None of us is a perfect manager of our abilities. Not even Pastor Bob. All of us have failed to maximize our gifts and our talents for God. We have devoted way too much of our time and our effort to doing things for ourselves, our own wealth, our own popularity, our own success, and all of that, rather than serving God by serving other people. Like Moses, we have made excuses and tried to weasel out of God's calling. The master in the parable that we heard today was pretty stern and demanding. But there's another parable that Jesus told in which a master calls his servants to account, and one comes before him who owed him an enormous sum of money, an amount that he could never repay in five lifetimes. And the master in the culture of that day is going to sell the guy into slavery along with his wife and children and his whole household and possessions. And the the servant falls down and begs for mercy. And the master, who represents God, of course, forgives him the entire debt. Just wipes it off the books. Of course, that master in that parable is our Lord, who is patient and merciful with us for the sake of Jesus who paid for all of our laziness and squandered talents and wastes of time and sniveling avoidance of duty, Jesus paid for all of that with his blood. So your sins are forgiven if by faith you accept what Jesus offers you. That is a gift from God that we call grace the undeserved and unearned mercy of God. But having said that, remember that grace is not a 
uh, a pass card. It is not an excuse to be a slacker with what God has entrusted us. Our talents are not ours. They are an investment in us. So today, I challenge you to take the talents that God has given you and use them for him. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for being so generous to us. All of us have such wonderful blessings, material blessings, relationship blessings. And today we really thought about these things that you have embedded in us, that you have loaned to us, that we call talents and abilities and skills and spiritual gifts. Thank you for them. Thank you for forgiving us when we have uh, treated them shabbily, when, when we have neglected or abused them or, or just spent them on our, used them for ourselves. Train us and inspire us, Lord, to, to see them as on loan from you to return to you, especially in service to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Moving on, let's, let's confess our faith, shall we? Let's uh, le- confess to one another. Yes, please rise. We'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son. the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers today, prayers have been requested for the following. For Valerie McLean, who is recovering from surgery. For Lisa Bennis, who is hospitalized. For Diana Kidder. uh, For Richard DeWitt, Bryce Williams, Roberta Hedger, Renee Tomes Dunlap, John Todd, Shirley Phillips, Richard Stoney's, all for continued health and healing. We pray for the family and friends of Patty Haig and Carol Gergit's uh, families. Uh, Patty and Carol died. We uh, lift up their families as they are in sorrow today. We pray for Cliff Gustafson, who will be having a surgical procedure on Wednesday. We pray for Melody Slaughter, my mother-in-law, Jim Gieschel, my father. They're both home from the hospital now. For Mike Marino, for health and healing following a surgical procedure. We pray for Israel and Ukraine for an end to war and for peace to be brought to those areas in the world. Let us go to the Lord in our prayers today. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness Bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. We pray, O God, that you would make us mindful and thankful for the gifts that you've given to us and help us to use them in service toward you and others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to advance the gospel, both at home and in distant lands. Bless our missionaries who serve far from home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and order our days in your peace. 
prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world. We pray for peace in Israel and Ukraine. Grant wisdom and discernment to those who are working hard to bring peace to that area. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless the schools of our church, especially Trinity Lutheran School, and all schools in our neighborhoods. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and state, and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need sickness or adversity, especially those we have named before your altar today. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow, especially for the family and friends of Patty and Carol. And grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Our closing song today is My King Forever. the gates of my heart, the veil in between is torn apart, now you hold the keys to the grave, cause you bring things to life, you roll stones away.
you, praise. You can clap for them. Thank you, praise team. But also, thank you, Ablaze and Rejoice Choirs. Let's clap for them as well. You did great today. Thank you, Pastor Buster. I'll let you go in front of me. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.